first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for staying this long uh, at the conference. Uh, also, I'd like to thank the organizers of the show. The show has been really great. Uh, we've all seen the uh, potential benefits of WebRTC. And uh, my talk is really about how to realize the benefits. Um, you know, based on seeing the demos yesterday, uh, the, some of the demos were really good. A lot of them, we really needed to make some more progress, especially in the area of services. So I would challenge the industry for the next show in the demo area to really come in with more services and value-added services. Because if we don't do that in the WebRTC world, uh, the ecosystem will be, we need that ecosystem and the WebRTC growth will be stunted. So we really need to bring services and the value-added services to what we're trying to do with WebRTC. And in order to bring the services, you need a media server. And so that's really what my talk is gonna be about today. So let's talk about some of the disruption and whether this is a sunrise or a sunset or both. From my perspective, this is a sunrise on media-rich communications. When we look at why people, what is the benefit of, of um, WebRTC, we did a survey, survey, I have a copy of it right here. Uh, we, you can go to our website to get the copy. 60% of respondents, and we had a lot of respondents to this survey. We sent it out to all of our customers and prospects and our marketing database. We got a lot of, a lot of recipients uh, on, on the questionnaire. 60% of the people said the biggest thing about WebRTC is that you don't need a client downloaded. Now, some, in the show, I talk, I've been talking to a lot of you for the last couple of days. Some people think that's a really big deal. Some people don't think it's a big deal. We're used to having clients on our smartphones. But just from a perspective of Dialogic, we had a demo that we did yesterday, a video conferencing demo, where we, where we, vi uh, we conferenced in uh, different different people that were on, say, a WebRTC client, uh, non-WebRTC clients, and streaming video. Uh, we, we did that same demo, essentially, in 2012 CTIA on LTE network uh, in New Orleans. However, with that, we needed to download clients. We had uh, SIP video clients we had to download. We had to work with SIP-enabled video hard phones, things like that. This was significantly easier. So from a perspective of not having a client, some of you may say it isn't a big deal. But for um, distribution of, of the product, uh, maintenance, things like that, it really is important uh, to do. However, another big area for WebRTC, why we see a big, um, uh, you know, why it's a disruption to the industry, is you're really going to have true unified communications. We've been able to do unified communications in this industry for at least 15 years years, if not 20 years. A lot of the technology is like a Frankenstein. You bring a third arm out, somehow you stitch it in. Uh, as with a WebRTC as like a real, true VoIP client, you can do things and have communications uh, that were never really possible before. And we can't even imagine some of that stuff uh, today. And, and you guys as smart developers in the community, the industry, we're going to see some really cool media-rich communications coming from WebRTC. And that really is the thing that's going to have to fulfill the promise. I also believe this is a sunset, a sunset of traditional telephony communications, like we grew up with, with a phone. You, you pick a phone up, uh, or maybe even with your mobile phone, you just make a call. We're going to have uh, video as part of a call. Maybe video is not the major part of the communication, uh, or voice is not the major part of the communication. But it's part of the communication. So we're going to see those kind of applications coming because of WebRTC that we couldn't see before. So what are the three main use cases for WebRTC? Obviously, the first one is browser to browser. Chrome, um, Chrome to Firefox or WebRTC-enabled browser to WebRTC-enabled browser. We make a phone call or a video call. You can see that you saw that out there uh, 10, 20 times in the demo area the last couple days. Obviously, the next one is browser to something else. I say something else. When you go off of the WebRTC range, you need to transcode uh, the voice or video codec. We need to handshake the signaling in a different way. Maybe someday, if uh, Apple and Microsoft embrace WebRTC, they might have little tweaks to the standard. You might even have to have a WebRTC to WebRTC kind of uh, gateway. 
that's obviously something that's important. We also saw those kind of demos out here the last couple of days and on the stage here yesterday. What really, we really care about in Dialogic is the media uh, server. We've been, we, and since 1983, we've been a company that's been doing media processing, media serving of some sort, and enabling these kind of applications. This is natural to us. Uh, so the value-added services are really important to do. The most basic one, let's just look at uh, browser to browser. I'm trying to make a phone call to you right here. You're not there. Let's go to a voicemail and leave a voicemail. That's the most basic kind of a service that we need to do. In order to do that, you need some kind of a media server to save the file in some way. It might not be a media server like we know today, but it'll be something like that. That's what I mean by a value-added service. That's the most basic one. And that's really what this talk is about. I'm not going to spend time talking about too much time about talking about one at all, a little bit on number two, and mostly about number three here. So what do we mean <clears throat> by browser to something else? We have a guy in the middle talking WebRTCs, talking through his computer or through his uh, smartphone on a WebRTC-enabled browser. He wants to call a landline. You have to transcode from the Opus codec to G711 to do that. You might want to call somebody on um, a mobile network, whether it's a 3G or a 2G network. You're going to have to go to different kind of codecs. If you talk to somebody on cable, it'll be a different kind of codec. When you're talking to somebody on Wi-Fi, it might even be a different codec. I put HD Voice here as one of those kind of codecs, AMR wideband. So there's definitely codec tra um, translation that has to happen, but also signaling translation that has to happen uh, to do this. And again, this is what the WebRTC gateway. There's also security that goes with this. I was sitting in a security session right before this <coughs> at 3 o'clock. Went through all the different kind of security that elements I would have to go with, whether it, it, a, a WebRTC gateway, probably uh, related to a session border controller, for instance. This is where it gets a little more complicated when you're doing video. So let's say um, you're, you're uh, recording or taking pictures through your web-enabled uh, phone, you know, your, your WebRTC-enabled phone, and you're sending it to different formats. You might be sending it to uh, uh, you know, HD uh, audio, I mean HD video format, SIF format or QSIF format, whatever. <clears throat> you want to send the right format to the right device. So you want to be context-aware, content-aware, because otherwise you're hogging the network up um, and it'll go slower. So we want to send uh, 720p or 10, 1080 to the big screen there. Um, we got to get that. We got to do VP8 to HD video. That's hard to do. We have to do that. And we have to do it to the other devices too. Video is also more complicated. You have bit rate, frame rate sizes. So we start delving into media servering um, with, with dealing with pure video here, not just the gateway. So we get into value-added services. We have, in order to create a service, we have a media server of some sort. Maybe it's an MRF in an IMS world. You have an app server that has the application. I put web application servers here, because <clears throat> in the WebRTC world, we really have the ability to get to web app, uh, application developers that don't really need to know SIP. And that's why I think there are going to be some real innovative applications being developed on WebRTC for communications. It's really important that we, we go after that community. SIP, as we all know, is uh, not, you know, I mean, you might say it's easy compared to what we did 15 years ago, uh, but certainly not as easy as uh, developing a web application today. And so we're going to be able to access that. And then we have the magic, and we get cool applications coming out that we couldn't think about before. Conferencing is one of the applications that is that, that is in need of a media server for the WebRTC. This is the most basic conferencing uh, application that we could think of in the WebRTC world. Every one of these five clients, say, is, is a WebRTC-enabled, using WebRTC-enabled browser to get onto the conference. However, to do conferencing, you need to figure out who, who's allowed to talk. We need a loudest talker algorithm to do that. Or, some kind of round-robin algorithm. You need some algorithm to enable the mixing to happen. You, you might want to enter a pin code or speak to get into the conference. 
that speech recognition or DTMF tone detection has to happen. And finally, echo cancellation. I'm on so many conference calls, and I know when I hear echo, there's not a dialogic product in the back running that conference. So we need to cancel the echo, and I've seen it in I more and more of the IP kind of conferences I'm on. We see a lot of echo, more than we used to see, say, 10 years ago on conference calls. This is important to do correctly so that we have a good conference call. Now imagine one of these five clients is not a WebRTC-enabled uh, device. It's coming in from some other uh, device. It might be coming in from a regular mobile phone or from a landline or something like that. We have to, we have to transcode that, those codecs and mix them all together. How do we do that? The signaling is also hard to do. You know, if it, was all, if it was all WebRTC, it's all the same signaling. So this is hard to do to enable a WebRTC-enabled uh, ecosystem like I was talking about before. So this is really key to enable, to do. And this is a very, very profitable application. We know media servers enable billions and billions of dollars per year of value-added services. And that's why this is important uh, that the industry, the web, our WebRTC, little in, WebRTC industry and ecosystem embrace all these value-added services. Because if it's just point-to-point, -point, or I call you and you're on a mobile phone, it's not good enough to enable the growth of WebRTC. Collaboration is another really good one. We did our demo up here yesterday uh, where we, we had uh, people standing with iPads and we conferenced it all in together and we had a stream coming in, all um, VP8 and H.264 um, all coming together. In this example, this could be like a distance learning example. We have um, a teacher and we have pupils watching and learning, for instance. But there's a lot of other verticals that could, that could um, benefit from WebRTC. We could, we could think about emergency services. We could think about real estate. Oracle out there, they're probably ripping their demo down now, had really good, um, really good application in terms of a real estate app where they had maps and things like that and handoffs. It was really cool application uh, that they were doing. And those are the kind of things that we need to do. We might also have, say, a fantasy football draft. When fantasy football happens, we could do something like this. So there's a lot of vertical kind of applications that would benefit from collaboration and, and do you need WebRTC to do that? No, you don't need WebRTC to do that. But it's so much easier to do that in a WebRTC world because the collaboration and communication would be so much easier to do. And I think this will be an area going forward where we're going to see some cool applications. Contact Center, another one. We have WebRTC-enabled uh, agents, WebRTC-enabled uh, uh, talkers like us calling into the contact center. From a WebRTC-enabled agent, it would be right now, you have to download a client to the agents and things like that. If you could create a web, a easy WebRTC application for the agents to use, that would be great. And in the middle of that would be a media server. When you call a contact center, everything is recorded. When do you record it? Call progress analysis of how the call is going through. Recognition, whether it's speech recognition or DTMF detection. Streaming, more and more when you're calling a contact center <coughs> in this environment, would be self-help. While, while you're getting self-help, you might be watching a video. That's what they might send to you. Or you might go find it yourself. And then finally, conference. Usually there's a coach. And a coach might be whispering to the agent uh, when they're getting trained. So the conference capability needs to be there. So WebRTC is clearly an example where we're going to see uh, innovation. And in this world, VoIP, when VoIP first happened, we saw a lot of the innovation in the beginning happen with uh, the contact center environment. So I feel like it'll happen here too as well. And then gaming. Actually, we have a lot of customers that do some kind of gaming. In Asia, the gaming is probably gambling, OK? But there's a lot of network-based gaming that happens and the media servers in the background. I just picked an example here of Fun Run, a network-based uh, game that you can download. And maybe you want the, the, the uh, turtle and the bunny to take out the fox. So maybe you could talk to each other. If I'm the turtle, I could try to talk to the bunny, and we can go crash the fox or something like that. Also with gaming, we're going to see 
uh, ad insertion, you know, we, we see ad insertions. Here's, a, here's an example of an ad on the bottom of that uh, Angry Birds. We see some ad that came up uh, to, to make a cheap phone call. Uh, but gaming is an example where a media server in a network-based game or an ad insertion would be in the background, requ required in the background. So there's a lot of examples of this. And what do they all have in common? Well, we need all different kinds of audio and video codecs. Whether we like it or not, the world is not going to be WebRTC enabled all over the place when we wake up tomorrow morning. It's going to take a long time. We still are dealing with uh, telephone lines, uh, even though VoIP has been 15 years <coughs> ago at least. So broad audio and video codec support for a long time, transcoding of that has to happen. The ability to conference it all together has to happen. Uh, recording and playing, streaming of it, okay? Media mixing, whether we mix uh, the audio streams together, how do we mix the video streams? The ability to do ad insertion is a form of mixing. Telephony functions like echo cancellation. And then, you know, we can't underestimate the protocol interworking that is required to mix this and mash this all together. This is all part of what a media server does and why it's so important for this ecosystem to take off that we need a media server to enable the applications. Video, I can't stress this enough. Video is key. The ability to do VP8 to H.264 is key. This is something we can do in our product today. That's why it all starts today. This is really important to do. Most of the high, you know, most of the video today is H.264. If we want to connect that into the WebRTC world, it needs to be able to transcode to VP8. This is really important today, and it's going to be important tomorrow and a year from now. So, okay, this is me talking about a media server. I mentioned our survey before. We di in the survey, we didn't ask a leading question. Do you need a media server? We didn't ask it like that. We really asked about, do you need help with some kind of uh, media mixing, et cetera? 65% of you came back with that survey and said, yes, we need help with media mixing. People that answered that survey, some of you knew probably that you needed a media server. Some people may not have ever heard of a media server because maybe they're coming more from the web world. Either way, they know that they, the development community, you, know you need some kind of a media server in the background in order to enable the cool applications that you want to write. So this isn't just me or Dialogic saying this. This is important stuff that came from you, the industry, via that survey. Another thing that's really important, WebRTC, software deployment options. Okay, we have a software-based media server. As we do WebRTC and go forward with WebRTC being an IP-based, um, uh, I'll call it an API for now, um, we're going to, I think a lot of these cool applications that people are developing are going to start in the cloud. We need this concept of network function virtualization. We've been doing it with our media server for over 10 years. We did it before the, I even heard of the term network function virtualization. It was just how we did it uh, because we know the power, as the power of the processors got more, you know, capable, that you could handle more and more um, uh, bandwidth through, through the processors. And we're doing this. We have a software-based SBC. The whole industry is moving a lot of the infrastructure towards network function virtualizations because of the benefits I list here. CapEx reduction, OpEx reduction, and new service delivery. You know, it's easier to do that. So in the WebRTC world, we definitely see the need for a software-based media server because you guys, as you develop these applications, are going to have new ways to develop them. You're going to want to do things in the cloud. And this is really going to be important to be able to deliver it. So that's really my message today. It was a very simple message. Okay, when I, when I come back to the next show, I want to go out there in the demo area or the, the equivalent of what we did last night to really see some cool applications because we've started to use media servers, not point-to-point -point kind of <coughs> calls. We're beyond that if we really want this to take off in the industry. I believe part of web, the, 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 um, the promise of WebRTC is it came at the right time. 
With LTE, we have a true on-ramp to the internet. And that true on-ramp to the internet is enabling these, these communications that we couldn't think of even three years ago. So WebRTC is here at the right time. We can, we can have a mobile on-ramp to the internet equivalent to what we get when we're at home or at work. WebRTC is really important for this promise, to fulfill this promise uh, in the world. And, and WebRTC, I, as I said in the beginning of this speech, it's really going to be important to, for the ecosystem to embrace the value-added services that, that we know we need in the industry here. And the, the media server is part of that. And again, we have, a, we have a, obviously, if I didn't say it before, you could, probably could guess it, we have a WebRTC-enabled software-based media server. And that's really what you know, we're, trying to, we're trying to help the industry with and have you guys use. And that's really it. That's my, that's my talk for today. And I uh, thank you very much.